Um, I am so excited um, to welcome our next panel in which panelists will discuss the importance of documenting oral history and preserving memorabilia, photographs, and other artifacts that fleeing Assyrians carried with them to the United States. Please join me in welcoming our panelists and mon moderator Ishtar Sayadi. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I promise I will not cry, um, and I will make you cry. So uh, thank you so much, Alex, for the introduction. And I am so excited to be here on this panel on this great occasion with these wonderful, amazing, intelligent women that are going to talk to us about the importance of preserving Assyrian history through oral histories. And we're going to get, the, get to hear them talking about the process of collecting all of these stories and how they're getting uh, put together and the importance of why we need to preserve this history. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and then we're just going to go down the line to keep it simple. So, ready when you are. Hi, I'm Annie Elias and um, I'm uh, also involved with the um, Assyrian Foundation of America. And uh, thanks to uh, Sargon, who's our president over there, who's here in the audience to support. <laughs> and there are a few other members here as well. Um, so I'm on this panel today uh, because I've been involved in a project for a few years now with my collaborator, uh, Dr. Ruth Kambar. Um, and the project began, it, the project is called um, Assyrians in Motion, and it began, and I'll speak more about the whole journey of this project. Um, it began with my dad's death in 2017, and my dad was super involved with the foundation for about 50 years, and he was, he's my Assyrian <laughs> uh, connection, and uh, he was like super Assyrian. <laughs> and uh, so when he passed away, um, you know, it was sort of like, oh, my Assyrian side is going with him. Uh, and so, but in the process of going through his things, um, we found literally in his closet, a, a box in his closet, we found two reels of 16 millimeter film. And we had, we took the film to a process, you know, a place that does specialized vintage um, film digitization, and the film is from 1937. There are two, two reels, um, one of the Assyrian diaspora in Chicago in 1937, and then the other one um, was a mystery, which I'll explain <laughs> later, uh, but led me to Ruth. Um, and this was just a, this remarkable um, document, this um, treasure, really, of the Assyrian American, uh, you know, early communities in in uh, the U.S. So, uh, so that has led me into a whole oral history project around this film um, that I'll go into more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Should I go next? Yeah, Thanks. please. And I'm Ruth Kambar. Hello, everyone. And I am an Assyrian who grew up in Yonkers. Both of my parents are Assyrian. And um, I grew up with a grandfather who was a storyteller for the family. He commanded an audience at any place we went, basically, um, <laughs> every dinner, but even to strangers who needed to know about being a Syrian. And he spoke to a lot of people that dismissed him. And I was not one of those people. I was very interested in the stories. Initially, I noticed patterns in the story. I'm an English teacher. I study narrative and the analysis of narrative. And I could see which stories were constantly repeated. I could see that he had created metaphors for his own being. And um, his perspective, he grew up in Ermia. He came here at the age of 14. and. Um, he suffered trauma, but never discussed it. Um, he lived to 102, and he passed away in 2002. Uh, he was born in 1900. And um, he had a way of connecting. And he sat me down, you can imagine, Bratti, 
This is who we are. This is what we are. Please keep it well. And when he told his stories, he felt the need to prove that they were true. So he had books that he would grab readily. One of the books is from um, Dr. Cochran's daughter, Emma. Mm -hmm. Look, it talks about my grandfather right here on this page. This is the mm -hmm. town we were from, Umbi and Turgawa, initially. Then he came down from the mountains, my great-grandfather, when his parents were killed by Kurds, and settled in Siri. So I learned about this. I learned about the attacks from the Kurds constantly. Um, my great-grandfather was raised by the Presbyterian mission because he was orphaned. I have recently discovered his sister and family, one of his sisters. They were separated. Because of that journey and recording those stories, it started to open up a world to me that I never imagined. There was a time in my email box when it was only American, English teachers, friends, now, when you look, every name in my email <laughs> is a Syrian. So I started recording these tales, and then someone came to me and said, what's wrong with my story? <laughs> How come you haven't recorded me? So I then recorded her. Now, her stories were a little different. They were actually set up as formal interviews. My grandfather, I got him going during those conversations, those mini lectures at the dinner table, quite different. Had him saying the Lord's Prayer in Assyrian. We've all learned it. Um, I have him recorded saying it. No dinner started without that. And this is how I grew up. My grandmother, I will tell you just very briefly, um, came in 21. I never knew until the past couple of years, actually this last year, was I able to confirm that she was at Pacuba. It was never discussed in my house. I know from a newspaper, series of newspaper articles, because believe it or not, she was kidnapped by a family that she came over with because they wanted her to marry the son. And they had to go to court. The family went to court. I actually found those records. So I now know that she was at Bakuba for three years. And so then I got into doing oral histories for the Yonkers Public Library because of my book. The librarian in Yonkers was very interested in looking at the stories. He didn't know about the community at all. And he was trying to contact people and kind of laughed at him. I said, no one's going to speak with you. <laughs> they don't know who you are. Let, let me go to church and talk to people about the project. And we got everybody on board. All right? And I started with the people that I know. And they're across the US because those were the people. I tried to get the older people first. So I started with the 90-year-olds. And even in doing the book, people sent me photos. I had done a mini gallery exhibit in Yonkers. Um, with another Assyrian, and we started collecting photos, which turned me on to do the book. People started sending in photos. The connections made from this work is probably the most rewarding part mm -hmm. of it. When someone can look at the book and say, oh my God, I did not know I was related right. to that other woman in my own church. Mm -hmm. That's my family in that photo. Mm -hmm. We are so dispersed that we're actually reconstructing our own histories. And you know, on Vasily Shumanam's um, Facebook page, a woman from Tiflis posted a picture of her grandfather and brothers. She realized later they weren't her brothers when I said, excuse me, they look a lot like my cousins, my uncles. And Vasily writes, because they are. <laughs> um, and so we started talking. They were first cousins to her grandfather. Wow. And we, we were actually able to make the connection. But imagine, a couple of years ago, I would have never known I had any relatives still in Tiflis. Okay? 
it's just, it's such a fascinating journey and I learn more and more and more each day. And I connected with Annie, and I'll tell you later, I guess, how. <laughs> and I connected with Kathy, and I'll be quiet now. I'm a storyteller too, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful, love it. Wonderful. <laughs> Uh, I could, uh, I'm a bad moderator right now, so I'm like, yes, tell me more. Like, I'm, just, I'm just fangirling right now, y'all. <laughs> you want me to say something? <laughs> Please. Okay. All right. I'm Kathy Zatari. I'm an attorney. I'm out in Arizona. Been an attorney since 1979. You're bright kids. You can do the math there. <laughs> I tried civil cases in state and federal court for most of those years. I also sat as a judge pro tem in state and federal courts in most of those years. And I'm raised that because I'm going to bring a certain legal perspective to the talk of genocide and documenting things and creating that evidence and making a record. So that's why I stress it. I do find, though, that one of the things that surprised me the most about Assyrian advocacy is um, um, all Assyrians really are related to each other. And I, I, I was shocked to find that out, but yeah. Ruth and I started working on an exhibit which will be the bulk of our talk today uh, at Cal State University. And in the course of the exhibit, we found out we're third cousins. <laughs> so, there you, there you have it. Uh, I have done Syrian advocacy work in addition to litigation. I've been uh, before uh, USERF, U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom. I have spoken to State Department, uh, State Department officials. I have also spoken with state and federal political representatives. I have worked with Refugees International uh, in their testimony before Congress to get uh, funding in northern Iraq after the onslaught of ISIS. Um, most recently, my project, why I'm here today, is to talk about the uh, Assyrian Genocide exhibit we are doing. And if I have anything to it, it would be a nationwide program by the end. And these lovely ladies don't know this yet, but I'm going to draft them to, to work <laughs> with me on this as well, and maybe some of you folks too. So thank you. Now I get to my favorite part where I get to ask questions. <laughs> So um, I, I know we're having some technical issues. We are going to be running um, Assyrians in Motion, but uh, they're working on it, so you will see it on the screen as it runs. But we're just going to chit-chat here. And one of the first questions I really want to talk about and have you all discuss is, what are oral histories and why are they important, especially for us as Assyrians? And how can oral histories deepen our understanding of Assyrian history in general? Um, I don't know who wants to go first, but. Do you want me to go first? Okay. Um, their stories, their history in people's own words. And very often when people's histories are dismissed from textbooks, that's the only way you're going to actually document and get these stories. And stories that are lived, experiential stories, reveal so much more than just cultural history, but you will get the cultural history. You will get, in, in the case of my stories, gender. I got a, from my great aunt that I interviewed, who was an in-law, her relationship to the family as a female in the 1920s. One of the first to cut her hair. I now know how to say a nasty word in Turkish. That's what she was called. <laughs> Um, but she lived under that. The, the Assyrian men made a bet against her when she opened her first store that she was able to purchase for $300. But then the question was, why does a woman need her own money? Mm. And so I learned about that and was able to connect with her story in a very different way. I also learned that her story was an I story and that my grandfather's was a we. Not in the king's we, mm. as my professors mm -hmm. assumed, but as a belonging to this collective community of Assyrians. He saw himself, he was the youngest child, the youngest to survive. When I was in third grade, his brother was 90. And so his family was gone, his friends were gone, the entire 
group that he knew was gone. He got together with his nephews and nieces and their children and grandchildren. Um, <coughs> his children and grandchildren. But I learned a lot more about the history of the Presbyterian mission and the subtle role they played, sometimes in helping and sometimes in destroying. And so my great-grandfather was murdered because he helped Emma Cochran. That story is not out there. She mentions him coming out to grab her, but she does not know, she's a little girl, what happened to him after that. Mm -hmm. Wow. He ki she was kidnapped by the Kurds from a tent. They were visiting Umbi outside. Her father had just died, and they were staying in a tent near the village because they had friends there. These are stories and names. I mean, we search for names. Um, this newly discovered cousin, Ashley Errington, who is a, how do you say, Hamas, uh, and uh, she's also a Benjamin. That's my family. We read books, journals, missionary journals, any kind of story that we can get to look up for our family, to piece together this history. And so to put these stories out, I've shared them with my students. My students are fascinated by this work because they have stories as well. And I try to get them to share their stories as I'm sharing with you my story. But when my aunt hands me a little kerchief, a piece of cloth with a pin, and says, you know, this is, she had it in a wallet. I had no idea what it was. I opened this purse thinking, what, what could it be? And it's this pouch of dirt that my grandmother grabbed out of Teke Edeshai. Hmm. So she was on the run, and she bent down at the age of 10 and grabbed some dirt from home and stuffed it in this little cloth. I have it. I carry it with me. So I can create that story now. That story is not in my grandfather's narratives. All right? right. In those narratives, too, we learn about how they settled in the U.S. and how difficult it was at first for them. How many of them may have had money, but they came here, and, and at least in Yonkers, worked in the factories because they were there. And that's the way they could procure work and um, support themselves. But their community was so tight, their markets were all Assyrian bread. Um, <laughs> and life was around the church and the association. Um, my great uncle from All These Stories was David Jacobs, who also was one of the founders for the Federation. And he started that association in 1914. Okay. In 1933, he and a group of friends created the Assyrian, AIDS, the, the Assyrian Christian Aid Society in Philadelphia as a response to what happened in Samal. Mm -hmm. We learn these things through these stories. I would not have known if I only looked at a date that mm -hmm. that organization was created. It could have been a coincidence. But I have the documentation to show why that was actually created. Mm -hmm. And I now just scanned for an archive their ledgers from the association with their minutes and what they were up to and what was so significant. And by the way, it took 50 years to lose the Assyrian language in the ledgers. Wow. So they start, the ones that I was able to access start in 35, and they go through the late 70s. It took 50 years to go from all Assyrian to all mm -hmm. English. Mm. Wow. I said I wasn't going to cry, but the, the grabbing the handful oh, of dirt from Teke Deshai, that's just profound. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you, Kathy, or Annie have any remarks? Yeah. I, um, so one of the things that and I do <laughs> in my profession <laughs> um, is I'm a theater artist, and I create um, documentary theater pieces. So these are pieces that are the actors interview people and then transcribe the interviews including every little pause 
in their speech, every gesture is noted. And then um, I take the transcripts of those interviews and um, create them into a, a really a, a score almost. Um, and, uh, and then the, the actors play, perform the people that, who they interviewed. So they are observing uh, not just the speech, like I said, but gestures, um, posture, mm -hmm. Um, all of the physical things that um, come across that are also telling a story and in, a, in characterizing a person or a people um, that are completely unspoken. And uh, so the oral histories, um, you know, they're completely subjective. So they're, they're beyond uh, facts and figures and so on. Um, they're meant to be, um, you know, it's part of the history is that this subjective experience and this really this physical experience that is, is beyond words. Um, there's a, a really great quote from the artist Henri Matisse. Um, he wrote this essay called Exactitude is Not Truth. And meaning, uh, I mean, there's a lot in that essay. I recommend it highly. <laughs> But um, he means that to really capture the truth of, in, this, in his case, it was a person when he creates a portrait, mm -hmm. um, you, it's not just a matter of you know, the exactness of this line or that line. You really, the truth of someone or a people, I think, is really an essence that he ca he's talking about capturing the essence of someone and that it's very, it's completely subjective. And that, it, to me, is, you know, history, the narrative of history is not just the facts and figures, and this happened, then that happened. It's what did my grandmother feel when she was fleeing uh, Ermia, and, um, you know, what, what did that feel like um, to have those experiences? Um, so all of that, is, is part of the story too. And I think an extremely important one and part of the whole picture of the truth. So that's my take. <laughs> May I just comment to that? Sure. Yeah. So in the novel, uh, The Things They Carry, mm -hmm. in yeah. chapter three, mm -hmm. there is a chapter about historicity versus truth. So mm -hmm. whose truth? If you live a particular truth, that's your truth. And that is, that mm -hmm. is evident mm -hmm. in your story. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, because your identity is constructed by the narrative you actually tell, depending on your audience. Mm -hmm. All right. So what my grandfather may have told me, or someone like David Armstrong, whose grandfather told him stories, they talked about things that my grandfather never would have said to me because I was female, because I was his grandchild, his daughter, granddaughter. All right. So that's also really important mm -hmm. that you mention that. And capturing these survivors if we could get first generation people you know at this point where we're trying desperately right. to get right. their children mm -hmm. from that first well i'll call it first genocide mm -hmm. um but it's not and um you know i have a cousin in california i will see in the end of june she's 97 and i have yet to record her so um I need her truth. <laughs> I want to follow up um, with something you both have explained, getting back again to when we're looking at evidence and what is persuasive. Again, what we need to do when we're thinking of genocide, actually what we need to do when you folks are thinking, all you young people doing your advocacy work, is you're making a case and you're selling it, right? Right. It's not enough to have the facts. Oh, one of the stupidest things I have heard in my life is, well, the facts speak for themselves. That has just been one of the most moronic <laughs> things I have ever heard of. And nothing I live by in practicing law 40 right. whatever years now. Okay, here is what is the most persuasive evidence just about what these ladies just explained. Picking up that dirt off the ground. What was going through that young girl's mind? If I were a lawyer making that case in court, I would be just picturing, picture that little girl, what she looked like. Her mom said, come on, come on, we're not going right. to make it. Grab right. that dirt. 
what your family went through. My grandmother, um, Fled Ada, had five original property deeds of her family. The last one came from the Assyrian council with its stamp. She bunched them all up and put them in her bag and fled on the road to Hamadan and got to Bakuba. All right, because like all refugees, she thought she'd go home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We all take our deeds, right? We all do. That thought process that young, she was a widow. The, the Kurds and the Turks killed her husband and her first two kids. Young woman in her early 20s walking on the road. What was she thinking when she was walking on the road? It is to make that persuasive case. That's why these things, you just think, well, it's what was in her mind. What does it matter? Oh, that's some of the best evidence I want to have in making this case. And when you young people are doing your advocacy work, start to look at it in that, in that frame with that lens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The lawyer brain, always looking for the odd evidence. <laughs> So now I want you all to tell us um, what's the most challenging part or the unique aspects of collecting these stories as far as just them being Assyrian stories and oral histories. What are the difficulties that you face? What are the unique things that you face? Who wants to go first? Well, um, I'll just throw in sort of the obvious, which Ruth already mentioned, which is my relatives that I began mm -hmm. interviewing um, you know, they're in their 90s, right. and, you know, it was almost too late because my uncle had a stroke just, you know, a couple of years after, and so that mm -hmm. story is no longer available, right. you know. Um, so that's, that's a big challenge is, um, you know, if you want to get that generation. Um, but I would say one, one other thing, um, which is that, so I never interviewed my dad. You know, I always thought, oh, we'll get, I interviewed my grandmother, Ariani Shia interviewed my grandfather, <laughs> thank God. Um, but I, I, you know, my, my dad, why didn't I interview my dad? And then he passed away and it was too late. Um, so I would say, you know, don't think just those really old people, think about, you know, your, your own parents and getting their story now, you know, right. um, or your, each other, honestly, you know, your, your story is, is valuable and you don't have to <laughs> think of it as, you know, because it's oral history <laughs> that it's got to be ancient. Um, you know, these stories, we, we need to collect all of them now. Um, you have a unique um, perspective. So that's just my, my pitch. <laughs> so true, Annie. Um, I, I did the same thing. Um, my dad passed away a year before Annie's, and we'll explain how that also brought us together without knowing. Um, but I, he was a storyteller as well, but I used to actually ask him to be quiet so I could hear my grandfather. <laughs> and uh, in one of the recordings, you can actually hear that. In another recording, you can hear my husband say to me, go check on the dessert in the oven. <laughs> and I walk away from that discussion, and I never came back. And mm. to hear that and realize it when you're going through these recordings of what could have been or what may have come up, it's such a sense of loss, and it leaves you with a real sense of emptiness. For me, the most, one of the most difficult things is when I transcribe these. And I've learned mm -hmm. how to do it. If anybody needs a shortcut, it's not great. But I upload it to YouTube for myself privately. And then I pull up their transcripts and have to obviously do major edits. But um, going through it that way, it, what an advantage from when I started and Ariane, I know you understand, with the recorder, plus rewind, breath, rewind, back and forth constantly, and typing, and trying to hear, um, and other people's voices that may have come in. But when I produce these transcripts, sometimes if you share them with the person who's living, they want you to edit them. Mm -hmm. And they want their grammar corrected. So I did interview somebody who has an incredible story out of Chicago. She was initially from Yonkers. And she sent it to her nephew. 
And his response to me in an email, and I haven't responded yet, it was a year ago, was, it's fine except for the glaring errors. <laughs> and I didn't make the glaring errors, and they're there because that's someone's speech. If I clean up, and, and I put that in quotation marks, but mm -hmm. if I edit them the way an English teacher would, they would all sound like me. Right. I would not have the essence of mm -hmm. that person. So it's so important, and when I first started recording my grandfather, he was 90, and I thought, no one will hear his voice again. I wanted to capture that voice. So when I said to you who we are and what we are and keep it well, I hear him. Mm -hmm. And I hope that if someone were to read this story, this transcript, they will hear him going through these stories. They will develop like you do when you read a novel. You create that character in your own head, that image of this person. I wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would just add one thing, following up again on the importance, interview people now. Uh, as you can see, uh, we're all old, all right? We're the grandchildren and we're old. So, I mean, y'all are running out of time here, okay? <laughs> but I want to give one story. <laughs> you laugh because you know it's true, but here's the thing. <laughs> Here's one example I can tell you about a lovely woman who runs a SAFO Center in Arizona, Dr. Ramina Jaju, who a lot of, you know, wonderful woman doing wonderful work. Her parents are the children of survivors of that genocide, and they live in Australia. Um, she came and asked me as we were working on our uh, California uh, exhibit project, uh, well, how about if I get a story from my dad? I have my grandmother's, oh, I'm saying, Ramina, go for it, that's wonderful. So she started taking down her father's story. He, older man, Australia, he'd seen everything, you know, a child of people who fled. She came back to Arizona and had the story. And she said, you know, I don't think I've, I ever saw my dad cry. He was so happy that I interviewed him. He was so happy someone cared enough to make this exhibit, to someone would tell this story for him. Grown men living in Australia most of his life and it was that important to him. So remember out there, this means a lot to a lot of people, and I just want to impress that on you. Our history is our yes. identity, right? Yes. That's who we are. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, so I want you, Annie, to talk a little bit about your mm -hmm. amazing film that's finally <laughs> playing, Assyrians in Motion. Now, my understanding is that you discovered the film by accident, Right, and yeah. can you let us know a little bit more where all this started and, and why you felt it was important to pursue, uh, pursue this project? Yeah, well, if you're watching, you can just see how amazing this is. It, it's yeah. just like so delightful. And so, um, you know, you were talking about joy in mm -hmm. the previous panel, and you can just see this incredible joy in um, the people's faces and the children and, um, that's not quite answering your your question, but um, there is just something to me, yeah. you know, I, I think we all probably have those pictures of our ancestors where they're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like incredibly stiff and you're just like, these are the most severe people. Um, and then you, but you see that, but they're not in motion, right? And of course those pictures are formal and they were, you know, had this real mm -hmm. f formal importance in the family. Um, but you realize when you see them moving that, oh, there's, there's humor, I mean, you can just see this incredible humor. They're just yeah. playing around, yeah. the kids are playing around, you, and you feel like, oh, that, those could be my kids, or, you know, they're just like us. <laughs> um, so, the, the, um, as I said, I, we discovered these reels in my dad's closet, <laughs> in a box, and... Um, so I took them and had them, did this high digitization of them. And the guy who did the digitization said, you know, this is really rare, this film. And you really should think about where you want to. He said, do you want to donate it to the Library of Congress um, National Film Archive? Um, and I said, yes, that sounds like the perfect <laughs> place for it. So that is where they are. Um, they're in a vault, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, temperature controlled, so they're, they're like per perfectly preserved. 
But we have this um, digitization that can be shared. Um, so anyway, I, we, he, but he said, you, we need a, to know a little bit, if you're going to donate this to the Library of Congress, we need to know a little bit. Do you know who did, who made this film and who, you know, where did it come from and what is the provenance of it? We just need some information. So that led me to um, start to sleuth around about the film. And I had, fortunately, I had two um, living relatives who are in the film there as children. Um, and actually, my dad is in it at age 12, my grandparents, and my great-grandfather. Um, so I, what I did f first was to, I filmed my aunt and uncle watching the film. And they, you know, so they would point out, oh, there's Jim Jacob, <laughs> or whatever, you know. So they began to identify people in the film and tell stories. So all of a sudden, oh, remember that, you know, and they, they knew the person who had, who had done the filming. He was a photographer whose studio was um, next to the Carter Memorial Church. And uh, they remembered being filmed. They actually remembered the event of being filmed wow. themselves. Um, so this was just, you know, incredible. So, so I, I made screenshots of all the people who they identified and, and then wrote their names and started to document who was in the film. And then the guy who did the, the um, digitization said, you know, this is, I, I had said this is Chicago. And he said, no, look. <laughs> and he showed me this image of this Sheffield milk truck and then a close-up of a New York license plate. And he said, this second reel looks like it's in New York. So I knew that there was a Assyrian community in Yonkers. And so I guessed that it might be Yonkers. So I Googled Assyrians in Yonkers. <laughs> and up popped Ruth Cambar's book, Assyrians of Yonkers, um, which had just been published that month. Wow. I wow. mean, miraculously. <laughs> um, so, so I ordered the book, of course, immediately. And when the book arrived, and I'm looking through the book, and I'm recognizing people in the book in the film. So I see this really distinct, dignified man, <laughs> elderly man. Um, and so I, I look at this picture in Ruth's book of this man and the family. And there's the almost identical picture in one of the screenshots um, of the same people. So I sleuth out Ruth's um, email address <laughs> and write to her and told her about it. And I included the screenshot of her, what turned out to be her great grandfather. And uh, <laughs> um, so she writes back. <laughs> You know, we're both crying and, you know, <laughs> oh my God, this is amazing. And so she, you know, I told her what I was doing and I said, do you want to also interview your, you know, do you want to be involved and collaborate on figuring out who these people are and so on? And so Ruth, being sleuth Ruth, <laughs> um, so it, it's not just Yonkers, it's um, what Ruth really discovered was that it's New Britain, it's Elizabeth, New Jersey, it's Philadelphia, right? right? It's all, the, so the photographer traveled around to all these um, communities and filmed them, just ordinary, as you can see, it's just ordinary home movies almost of, of you know, people's life. So I'll turn you go ahead. <laughs> so John Baba, referred to as Aga John Baba, uh, had a printing press in Chicago. And we think this was his way of advertising and letting people know about the printing press. So he traveled from what he called colony to colony. I found an article in his um, 
Chronicle. Right. Yeah. Had his, yeah. yeah. What's the uh, the Kitavana? Kitavana. Yeah. And um, had it translated. Uh, Joseph Hermes helped us with that. And um, I had a feeling it was about this. We we got the date. I saw the date. I'm like, ah, that 1937. And sure enough, it was an advertisement about the film. And then I was looking through old Assyrian stars. So like. The way I look through narratives and journals, I'm looking through any kind of periodical also because you'd be amazed at the information you can get if you're reconstructing your family history, other people's family histories. And I saw that um, in the 50s, they were raising money with this film. Wow. So um, Annie writes to me, I get it on my school email right before work. <laughs> if you're a teacher, you know, I start at 7.30. I watch as much as possible before I got to work. And I saw my great-grandfather for the first time alive. I saw my great-grandmother alive for the first time, um, cousins, aunts that I knew. Um, in fact, one cousin is in her teen years, and she's all over the film. She just passed this year at 99. Oh, wow. And um, to be able to give this to her sons is just incredible. But um, I got to work, and well, I'll just tell you one more thing before I get to that. I had always looked for anything published by my great-grandfather. I knew that he had done work for the British Museum in translating biblical texts. I knew that he had done all of this work. My mom, who has dementia, draws a symbol I now know is a cross on an ancient Bible text that he must have translated. He taught her how to do it. She does it constantly. So to see him, um, and right before I submitted the book, I Googled him. Now, it sounds ridiculous. I had access to every library on the planet. Did not find his name anywhere. But at that point, we had Google Translate. All of these Dutch sites came up right before Annie contacted me. And I found his biography through Google Translate in Dutch. And I, it was the night before I handed in the book. I was hysterical crying at 11.30 at night for a teacher. It's very late at night. <laughs> and uh, I get up at 5. And I was just so overwhelmed. I had to read the entire thing. To mention my great-grandfather my grandfather as a baby. To mention my great-aunt who fell off a roof in uh, Syria. To see this in print from another country was just incredible. I didn't completely understand why, and if you're in the workshop later, I can show you a picture. But looking at this, the surprise I got, once I got to school on my first prep period, I was still watching, and there was my dad coming across the screen at the age of 12 in knickers, and I lost it. The bell rang, my students came in, and there I am in a puddle <laughs> at this computer. And I'm showing them the film. Look, you guys, this is my dad. Um, what an incredible, incredible experience. And like I can do for people with the archive, and I'll talk a little more about that later, but the making connections for people, Annie did that for me, and it, what an incredible gift. And I give this gift. I get to pass it on to others, too. People are constantly looking for their relatives. They have the story. I did what Annie did. I tried to record my mom and her cousin, the 97-year-old, when they were identifying people. But what they got, I realized, I really couldn't use for research. Their stories were... Oh, that's so-and-so before she got her nose job. Oh, <laughs> look at that one. That looks like, my father looks like he's missing a bleeping tooth. Yeah. And I'm, I'm watching this, and I'm like, okay. I was laughing so hard. Yeah. But that's who they are now. They're very free with their opinions. There's no art the, the funny thing is my aunt and uncle did exactly the same thing. That's before she put on all that weight. <laughs> I just, it, the stories were hysterical. And... <laughs> Um, that milk truck, by the way, that oh, yeah. Annie saw with that ear plate was my grandfather's. Oh my gosh. Uh, during the Depression, we lost our farm in New Britain. 
And he told the milkman when they came to Yonkers that he couldn't afford to pay the, the bill. And the milkman said, I'll get you a job. And I know this from the oral history. And I even know his name is Sheridan. And guess what? I found a photo of all the milkmen. And there's Sheridan in the middle. <laughs> and the date on the photo is 1937. <laughs> so. Kathy, do go you for have it, any Kathy. <laughs> I, uh, addition. Bigger picture again. Yes. Okay, evidence of genocide. And diaspora stories when people are first settled. Okay, there is the great granddaughter of Dr. Isaac Adams here. Is that right? Okay. Um, I'll tell you something. My, um, my, gotta get this right. My grandfather's sister was in the second family that uh, his Dr. Adams took to North Battleford, Saskatchewan. And that was before the California colony that he settled up. And so what we're looking at with these stories, I have the, and yeah, not to be labor, we could all get up here and tell you ancient history of our families. <laughs> Photographs from, from Saskatchewan. Uh, one of the boys he had, their last name was George, my maiden name say it, and so it was Hutton say it, married David George. Okay, one of the sons, Jeep George, he became a great, uh, uh, God, what is that crazy sport in Canada they do with the ice? Curling. I'm Hockey. from Arizona. Curling. I don't do that. Curling. Curling. No, hockey. Hockey. Curling. Hockey. I don't do that. <laughs> hockey? What is that stuff? But Jeep George became this great hockey player in Western Canada. Okay. But these are all diaspora stories to capture, and they're, uh, they are stories of a people. Sure, they're all our individual stories, but these are things that you have to keep hold of as you go forward and use them in your advocacy work. That, I think, is like the bigger lesson out of right. this, and that's what I did. May, may I just say yes, one thing? Sure. So my Aunt Lucy, who bought that store, is in the film. And when I was doing the book, I looked for a photo of that store. No one had one. Her son did not. She's making a sale in <laughs> the store in this film. <laughs> to have that, and you see her waving the money, her husband's <laughs> waving the money still. Um, and the reason that she needed that money, by the way, she left him. <laughs> she did leave him. She made enough Knit money one pearl to go. Uh, he was my, my grandfather's brother. Um, but that also was captured. And so it's really important to know that she, her narrative, was considered by my NYU um, chair for my committee to be irrelevant. Um, that she was only four during the SAFO, and he believed that she was in a fantasy world, that she had created this narrative. But what stood out for her and what she held on to were images. She remembered women throwing their children over the bridge and in bundles and asking her older brother, what is that? Mm. She remembered the Red Cross being at Bakuba and uh, getting there with her um, grandmother being there with the Samawada. She remembered these images. So, you know, if there was a part of it was the collective memory, so be it. It's the collective memory. But she's here. So when you see a woman at a register, that's Lucy. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. I, I could just sit here and talk to you all forever. And <laughs> I'll be honest, I think we can listen to these stories forever, too. But we're going to wrap it up and give um, uh, folks a chance to ask questions. But before we do that, Kathy, can you talk a little bit about the exhibition that's going to be going up at um, Cal State, yes. Stanislaus, my alma mater? Oh, um, okay. And, and yeah, wonderful. And tell us a little yes. about it. Uh, June 30th. Um, an exhibit is going to be opening at the gallery space at Cal State University Stanislaus campus in Turlock. Mm. It will run till August 7th. Uh, this is a culmination of some hard work where you and I have gotten to know each other way too well. Um, <laughs> and we, that and I know, I, I know, on person it's true. And I want to give a shout out to Hannibal Travis who has done a, just an incredible job helping yeah. us as well. And one more shout out to Professor Aaron Hughes who is an incredible young academic at Stan State. Uh, and with her work and the university's work, I cannot thank them enough. And by the way, folks, y'all, I can say this because I'm half Irish here. You know, when you get people outside the Assyrian community stepping up that big, go thank them. 
because they have really helped us so much with this exhibit. Uh, we, the thrust of the exhibit is the genocide period, but it's tell our stories, ac uh, artifacts of the Assyrian genocide. We are going to have originals of items. We're going to have original clothing that women sewed in the camps. Okay, original scarves, original deeds, documents from the era, not photographs, not scans, the original items. And that I thought was so important when I tormented these lovely people to try to do this a couple of years ago. Um, I have been, as many of you have been, at, at the Holocaust Museum in mm -hmm. DC in different areas. And uh, my in-laws, my mother-in-law is a Holocaust survivor, by the way. And, and I remember going to those and seeing the ordinary items, seeing the little children's shoes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. seeing um, eyeglasses, seeing little family photos, mom and her kids, and they're smiling. These little things are just gut punches. Right. Okay, these artifacts, these actual items that people took, managed to take when they fled or made them in the camps, right? These things are absolutely huge. And, and by God, get hold of your older relatives and try to preserve as many of these things as you can. But that's what we're doing out in California. ASU, Arizona State University, is interested in a similar program next April. Um, I would say this too, we're going to have speakers who, uh, who will come as well. Right now we're finalizing our speakers group uh, over at Stan State. Uh, we'll have some at the beginning and also at the, at the close on August 7th. Uh, please, if you're in the area or can travel over there, uh, please look for it. Also, Stan State, has, besides stepping up and providing us all the space, all the gallery space, uh, just in huge, huge resources for this, they are also going to help us prepare an online exhibit. Mm -hmm. Everything is free, by the way, open to the public, completely free. Uh, last thing, California Humanities, it's a nonprofit in California. Mm -hmm. We applied for and did receive grant funding from Cal Humanities to, to develop and put on this exhibit. One of the things, and I think you advocates, you could learn a lesson from this. One of the things we, they found persuasive because about only 12 to 15 percent of their annual cycle uh, applicants get grant funding. So we did pretty well on that. Yeah. Uh, what was the tide of California, those early, early Turlock communities, what Dr. Isaac Adam did to bring those people there, the, the second wave in the 20s after the genocide. So we were able to have a, a very good freestanding piece on California to really tie with the local communities. And that's what we're putting on. Please. And I wanted to say thank you to Sargon Donovan also yeah. because he put Kathy in touch with me. Um, you know, I got this phone call from this attorney in Arizona. Hey, you. I think you could do this. Uh, he's like, well, I did a little exhibit in Yonkers. Yes, I know. Um, and so Annie and I also went to Sargon. Sargon helped me with my dissertation. Um, and I reached out to, I knew there were Assyrians in Chicago when I grew up. I heard about them from my grandfather. So I called an association there and someone said, you should speak with Sargon. On a bed. And so I called him and he helped me out a great deal. But Annie and I, I also said to her, let's apply for a grant with ASA, Assyrian Studies, to come up with a way to travel to identify the people in this film. And we didn't get as far as we'd like yet because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, especially because we were trying to interview or meet up with older people. It, it put a little hamper on that. May I say something about the archive? Yes. All right. Absolutely. And ASA is also working on a digital archive. Um, I'm working with Ramson. <laughs> I am working with Esther. <laughs> and I am working with Julia. Where's Julia? Hi, Julia. <laughs> OK. And maybe Sarah. Sarah's really busy, but I, you see, I have another project in mind for Sarah <laughs> and Mary. Uh, and so um, we've been working on an archive, digitizing, working with some of the Mara documents as well. And so we will accept yours, I can tell you. We are interested in what you have. And what's really important to understand, like even in these ledgers, sometimes the minutes are boring. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Uh, sometimes they're very funny to see that the man who thought he punched Gasha um, and tried to get reinstated to the association and there's a huge rejection on his uh, membership form. Yeah, they can give you a chuckle. But no matter, it's documenting our history. And to even notice the language change is huge, okay? It's a part of our history of Assyrians in the United States in diaspora. So we are interested in your family photos, your documents. Um, even, believe it or not, Ramson helped me. We look at, I have a little notebook, it's an address book, and my great-grandfather wrote some figures in it. He's obviously either lending or borrowing money from family members, but there are addresses in it. Mm -hmm. And it's incredible to see in the 1920s and 1910s whose addresses he had and what names. John Baba is in there, okay? Mm -hmm. Sam Arsanis and Elias, you know, and, and Sam Jacobs, the publisher out of New York. They're all in this little manual and a couple of Presbyterian ministers here and there. It's vet manual, this little notebook. But Ramson helped me translate some of it and the backs of photos. So you assume that it just identifies people. Sometimes there are love notes. <laughs> Even from your great grandfather, who's a minister, to his wife. Um, and, you know, it's incredible to see, and I'll bet he never imagined over a hundred years later his great granddaughter would be reading this <laughs> but and sharing it with others but um you know even the stamps on photographs like, there's a shalita family in philly and they were in baltimore and we realized the connection i started to recognize the shade that was behind the families that they pulled down like a screen because it's a fake window and so I could place where these people were by these photos. And I've gotten really good with faces, eyebrows, you look, <laughs> and I can identify people. The Arsanis, uh, this woman from uh, Tiflis, her great-grandfather, I found him in um, Arsanis' photo of San Francisco in 1914. You just don't know. Yeah, that's, I mean, literally, Thank I could you. listen to you all day. but. Let's ask some questions. So, who has a question? Okay. Rain. 1937. I'm also looking for Aunt Lucy. Like, <laughs> when Yonkers comes right? up, I'm looking for her. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, I'm just going to respectfully ask that we keep it to questions, please. If you have comments, uh, Annie, Ruth, and Kathy are going to be around, and they'll also be at the workshop tomorrow. So, questions only, please. Thank you for this great presentation. Uh, I have a, a question from Kathy. Kathy, are you related to Dr. Isaac Adams? No, 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 not related. Well, no, no. He took, oh, this, you want to hear how everyone's related. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. Dr. Isaac Adams took two groups of Assyrians to North Battleford, Saskatchewan. Oh, okay, all right. Well, in this place, my grandfather's sister and her husband was in the second group that he took. What was their name? Uh, his name was David George, and her name, her name was Hutton. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. I rest my case. <laughs> Thank you very much. It, it was truly amazing to hear all your stories and this wonderful movie. Um, um, so my question is to Dr. Ruth Ramber. You, in your statements, you mentioned something about Presbyterian mission in helping and also destroying. Was it helping and destroying culture, population, in what forms? I actually think it's a little of both. Um, I will tell you that Mr. Cochran let my great-grandfather know that he needed to leave. Um, I will also tell you that my great-grandfather left the presbytery for a short while and went to the Dutch Reformed Church because he disagreed almost, and I'm learning, about the Annunciation 
Um, and the idea mm. of the mother of God, mm. like Nestorius. Mm -hmm. And so he walked away from these Presbyterians, and I learned that the, the Dutch Reformed Church was very similar. They saved us in that my two great aunts actually were sent to the Netherlands to go to nursing school when they were young because they were afraid they'd be raped. And we had a place for them to go. Mm. So I will show you in our workshop, I brought a photo. I always had this photo of my great grandfather with my two aunts in these very formal, expensive clothing. And I was told it was in Amsterdam. I don't even know if my great -grandf my grandfather knew what the real connection was. He thought they were my gr his father's friends. I assume they were Presbyterian ministers, okay? There's a connection, by the way, to the church. Um, but when I look at how the Kurds went after us, or how my great-grandfather says, or my uncle, that my father got sent to Turkey, and conditions were so bad to preach. I mean, essentially, it was against the law to convert a Muslim. So there were these Assyrians that could do the bidding, for the Presbyterians or the Lutherans, etc., And so he came home because it was too dangerous. He was sent back again. And this was his livelihood. And he believed in what he was doing, but it put the family at major risk. So the story that got filtered down about my great aunt, the little girl who fell off the roof, I got a very different version from the Dutch. They were running from Kurds. There was an attack on the town, and they were jumping from roof to roof. She and my uncle fell. She was killed. Wow. So they came after us, I think, with a vengeance also, because we were performing illegal work on some level. And it separated us with the church. The Presbyterians have left Yonkers, mostly. Marmari is there now. It's the Church of the East. That connection between the two groups is almost lost. And um, that has to do with the project, by the way, Sarah, that I want to bring together again. Question? Hi. Um, I was wondering, uh, the wealth of information you guys have been sharing has been so valuable. If you could describe your process uh, from beginning to end and how you create these archives and these interviews? Uh, do you mean the film project or other? <laughs> An oral history. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to? Uh, well, for the, for the film part of it, um, there's like three different or six different projects here. So, um, you know, like I said, we would well, I was actually filming my relatives, um, watching the film, and then taking screenshots, and then identifying, you know, putting identification. Um, so what Ruth and I have been doing is collecting all of these identifications. And um, we have a lot of documents um, now that, and, and some, some of the research, um, and so on. And all of this, by the way, is going to go up on the ASA website at some point. <laughs> we, we, we um, you know, beg your <laughs> patience uh, as we got through COVID and we're both teachers and et cetera. But um, we are hoping to really get, get this um, whole project, at least in some uh, form, it will be on an exhibit on the ASA website. You will be able to see the entire, both reels, the entire, what you're seeing here is only 35 minutes. It's about two hours of film. So you'll be able to see that, download it, um, so that, uh, and then you'll see our research, our identifications, some of it, um, with little clips and so on, and, and you know, just some information about the, the photographer, et cetera. Um, but we're really, we really want this to be a communal project. That's why we're putting it on a website, because someone could write and say, hey, that's not really <laughs> Aunt Judith. <laughs> that's, you know, my aunt <laughs> so-and-so. And, you know, we, we're kind of imagining that people will keep adding to this um, and that it'll be a communal 
oral history project. And we're hoping that people will also take these um, you know, pieces and you know, whatever you're, if you're interested in dance and music, maybe you'll use this for some, for your research or some other, something else. So uh, that's at least about the film. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just want to say I developed a list of questions for ASA to start with, um, and I can share them with you. Uh, you have to be flexible. You have them. Um, for the workshop, we'll share them. Yeah. And right. um, you have to depending on who you're interviewing. And sometimes the organic conversation to just trap it is better. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. even a, when I said any kind of document, my grandfather wrote on envelopes. I think for his own memory, every sibling, when they were born, where they were from, where they went, he, on all scraps of paper, my aunt saved them all. Mm -hmm. I have to be quick. <laughs> With all this material that you're gathering, do you envision producing the stories, the storytelling, and the history that writes Assyrian women back into our history? Mm. Mm. Oh, I love that. Mm. <laughs> That's Michael, a great idea. <laughs> it's, it's unavoidable. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, unavoidable. When I interviewed Mary Suleiman, I don't know if anybody knows the Suleiman family, um, to get her story, even something as basic. She wanted to go to Mount Holyoke because of Fidelia Fisk. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's how she got admitted to an Ivy League school for girls. She became a secretary because at her time in life, that's what that degree could get her. Imagine, and sharing that with my students. My students were like, but she had a degree, so how did she not, what, what major? So is there anything wrong with being a secretary? No, but here was someone with a college degree with a particular major who couldn't procure a job in that field. And so, yes, that's the answer. And it's, it's going to be called, so don't anybody take, reconstructing history. Yeah. So I did constructing identity, now it's reconstructing history. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, unfortunately for all of us, this is all the time we have with these amazing, intelligent women and activists and, pardon my French, badasses. Um, uh, so now we're going to uh, introduce to you some more amazing people that are bringing our story to the front um, using a different medium and using the uh, medium of art. And it's actually, I'm like really excited right now because I get to introduce to you my cousin Narden and Akadina with Diaspora in Bloom.